This meeting is being recorded. Great. Okay, so let's get started. Uh, welcome all, whether it's good morning or good afternoon to you. Welcome to today's thought leadership session on the topic of supporting your leaders to navigate challenges and opportunities in 2022. So before I start with introductions, just some housekeeping. Today's session will be recorded, and yes, we will be sharing the recording with you post-session. And if you have any questions throughout the session, please feel free to type these in the Q&A section. And what we're planning to do is leave some time at the end so that we can respond to these. Okay, so let's start off with introductions. Uh, my name is Carmel Badichotto. I head up the client partnering team across APAC at LHH. And my role is basically to partner very closely with our clients to understand their uh, context, uh, their learning needs, and to design fit for purpose, best practice learning and development solutions. So very happy to be here today talking to you about such an important topic and very excited to introdu introduce Colin Pritchard, Head of Human Resources at Ericsson. Colin, I'll give you a chance to introduce yourself. Thanks, Carmel, uh, and welcome to everyone to the, uh, to the webinar today. Uh, I hope that we're able to share with you some insights and some learnings that we've had along the way. But before we start, I'd just like to uh, make an acknowledgement to the traditional owners and lands with which we meet. Uh, we recognise their continuing connection with the land, air and water uh, and their ongoing connection to the community that we, we work. Uh, we also recognise and respect and pay respects to elders past, present and emerging. Uh, so thanks, Carl. Well, my name is Colin Pritchard. I uh, head up the HR function here in Australia and New Zealand. Uh, and it's with great pleasure I get a chance to be able to chat with you today. Great. Thank you, Colin. So we're going to get started with some interaction. Always love a good poll. And to give you some background here, in June of last year, LHH, uh, in partnership with ADECO, conducted a global survey of almost 15,000 people across 25 countries and found that many people are reassessing their working life in a variety of different ways. And one of the questions was around, um, you know, individuals and where they were at from a from a, a career point of view and asked whether they were likely to consider leaving their current employer in the next year for a variety of different reasons. So what I'd love you to do now is to select the percentage of individuals from this study that you think were considering leaving their current employer in the next year. So we have uh, three options here, 41%, 13% and 25%. So I'll give you a few seconds to vote. <clears throat> okay, so uh, the results are in and 69% of you have voted 41%. 30% of you have voted 25% uh, and only 1% indicated that 13% that was the answer. Okay, so the survey says in true family feud style, the answer within our study was 41%. Uh, so most of you are on the money and have selected this. Startling and significant result. And really, if we think about it, with there being so much change and disruption over the last two years, Employees are re-evaluating their priorities, their home bases, their entire lives. So whether it's due to the fact that they feel they have less career advancement opportunities and COVID being a, a driver of that, whether it's their understand, whether it's them understanding the need to reskill into a new career pathway, or whether it's related to you know lots of other uh, pandemic-related struggles, more people are considering their next move. And the way that organisations approach this next phase of work is going to impact who stays, who goes, but also who wants to join your organisation. So let's talk a little more about the changes that we are seeing across, um, across the workforce. So 
Over the last five years, there have been over 3 million academic journals that have cited the term future of work. And I think it's, you know, we're probably all sick of hearing about it, but this was topical before, um, you know, COVID even hit us. So we know that there are significant changes happening in the workforce. Uh, whether, you know, this is caused by digital disrupt disruption, demographic shifts, um, you know, as well as a global pandemic, they've all changed how we work and how we will continue to work in the future. So if we look at some of these elements, you know, how work is distributed, well, according to the World Economic Forum, 50% of employees are going to need reskilling by 2025 as technology adoption increases. And the pandemic has only accelerated the need for employees to learn new skills. What we learn is changing. So the top skills and skills groups which employers see rising include critical thinking and analysis, as well as problem solving, and also skills in self-management such as active learning, resilience, stress tolerance and flexibility. How we learn has changed. So we've seen a five by increase in online learning opportunities provided. So individuals are definitely more open to, to digital learning and seeking out learning opportunities. And how we lead, collaborate and care is changing. So more of a focus on agility and communication, more of a focus on flexibility, employee care, and where we work is changing. And we know this from all of the, the changes that have happened over the last couple of years where some of us or most of us have been forced to work in remote environments and now we look ahead as to what that looks like in the future. So let's talk a little bit more about the, the where we work element. So something interesting here, um, and again, this, this data has been pulled across a, a range of different studies, there seems to be a disconnect between what executives consider the new normal versus employees. So you'll see here on the left that 52% of executives are saying that four days or more in the office is the way to go. But let's look at what employees are saying. This 52% of employees are saying that hybrid is their preference. And, you know, based on our experience working with organisations across the world, you know, we've seen some organisations trying to mandate at least four days in the office aligned to that executive view and then experienced severe backlash from their people as a result. So you can see on the right there the percentage of individuals who might actually consider leaving a business if they're forced to work completely on site. So... The good news is we have seen significant improvement in productivity in a remote working world. So we can all relate to this back-to-back -back meetings, you know, who needs commuting to the office when we can just have more meetings, we can fit more work in. And I'm sure we've all had that experience where people are dropping off meetings, you know, five minutes before the end to have a quick bathroom break or grab a drink because it's the only time they can do that. But this has come at a cost. So almost half of respondents to our global study stated they feel somewhat burnt out. And the Microsoft Work Trend Index report showed that employees across APAC actually have the highest rates of burnout globally. And this is due to lack of separation between work and personal life, as well as worry of contracting COVID-19. And there have been other trade-offs to higher productivity. So we've seen important outcomes such as team innovation, collaboration, you know, they've been negatively impacted as you can see on the, the left-hand side of the slide. Uh, and you can see that on the right, people do want more in-person collaboration post-pandemic. However, 47% feel that there isn't clarity on what a post-pandemic working environment looks like, which is a concern. And you know, what we've talked about in relation to burnout and these negative outcomes have been associated with 100% virtual working environments at the, at the time these studies were conducted. So how do we redesign the workforce of the future to mitigate these risks? Well, let's demystify some of the myths first. 
So there are three assumptions that we see that leaders need to unlearn. The first one, we can't have one rule for some and one rule for others. Consistency is key. So we either bring everyone on site or everyone off site. Well, the new work design principle is actually about establishing a quality of opportunity and showing your people that you value them rather than trying to create a quality of experience because what they do and how they do it will impact where they need to work. The second, innovation relies on the water, cool com water cooler conversation. Well, new work design principle. We need to actually be a little bit more deliberate about how we design opportunities to innovate and collaborate. So an example is someone coming into the office, you know, no one else is there, so they're not really collaborating. So how do we be more purposeful around where we do need to work more closely together to innovate? And finally, I can only manage what I can see. Visibility is a key ingredient of performance management. And we've seen this with legacy management mindsets where I need to see you in order to know, you know what you're working on and how you're working. Whereas the new work design principle is performance by outcome, not performance by inputs or hours, which can also drive presenteeism as we know. So how do we get this right? So at a very high level, uh, some of the, you know, the three key factors that we've seen consistently across organisations who are on the right track, because I think that, you know, something here is that we're all still testing and learning, uh, are these three areas. So purpose and drive, being very clear about the purpose of the organisation, but also how individuals can contribute to that and the outcomes they need to achieve. Belonging and best contribution, basically creating a safe environment and helping your people be their best selves, no matter where they are and agility and flexibility. So enabling innovation and high performance and making the right decisions based on individuals, their circumstances and their role, no matter where they are. So to really bring this to life, I'd like to hand over to Colin now, who's going to take us through the Ericsson journey and how that's, that's played out for them today. So I'll hand over to you, Colin. Thanks very much. Can you hear me, Carol? I sure can. Super duper, we've got the technology working, happy days all around. Um, thanks very much for the introduction. And uh, and I guess I just wanted to sort of contextualise what I was going to share uh, with this community today and talk a little bit about a conversation about where we've been and where we've headed. And there's sort of three parts of that story. And the first bit, I'll just share a little bit about who and is, um, what our role is here in Australia, and then just take us down a, a pathway uh, of describing our, our journey in the last sort of two years or so, and then maybe give you some thoughts about where we're at at the moment as we try to grapple with some of the challenges that Campbell's just described. So in terms of Ericsson and, and who is Ericsson, Ericsson is a global uh, provider of technology primarily towards the telecommunications industry. Um, we're a Swedish-based organisation with approximately 100,000 employees uh, operating in most countries across the globe. Uh, it's a very old organisation. Uh, Ericsson uh, was there at the beginning of telephony. So when Alexander Bell was uh, developing the first telephone in, in Canada at the same Lars Magnus Ericsson was also doing a very similar thing in, in Sweden at the time. And so it's an organisation which has been uh, around for a long time, both globally and, and here in Australia. Uh, and in, in fact, here in Australia, it's been part of the, the community for over 130 years at the beginning of when the first telephone was sold in Australia and have been there really through the transition of, of mobility and the advent of mobility in the last 30 or 40 years. Uh, and today we are the primary supplier of 5G, the fifth generation mobile networks towards Telstra, uh, Optus, also TPG, and we provide the fixed uh, wireless network in the MBN network as well. And what do we supply? So we provide the hardware, software and services around what we call the radio access network, which is what all of us can see on top of a building or on top of a tower, for example, the core equipment, which is sort of, you know, mostly sits inside an exchange or now a sort of virtual exchange and all the software that supports billing and security and makes the whole thing work together. Our workforce uh, here in Australia, New Zealand is approximately 1200 people uh, in terms of our direct force. And then we have an indirect workforce of about 2000 people throughout the service providers. Um, so hopefully that will provide some sort of context of, of, of who we are. Um, I'll just take you briefly back to the very uh, top point here, which is about the way that we operate and operate across uh, 130 countries. And it is very important to what Carmel mentioned before about the way we work and collaborate across borders and across 
um, across cultures as well and has been part of our delivery for some time. But I will come back to that. So if we just then maybe describe a little bit about, um, and I thought I'd share with you what our experience has been over the last um, 12 to 24 months. Uh, and there's a reality that the people that will be on this call come from very different experiences. And I uh, recognise and absolutely respect that our experiences will be a little bit different. We are obviously a large organisation and, and perhaps some of the things that we're, I'm going to share with you today is not necessarily your experience and, and your industry and your company, maybe uh, things that you've done similar or perhaps not able to provide that. So I, I just recognise that we all come from a very different experience here. But I thought I'd just sort of share you this little model, uh, which I thought was really helpful. And this is actually based on the William Bridges change model. And I think most of us will be sort of familiar around about what happens in states of change and how as us as the human uh, response to that, respond to the, the events that unfold before us. And it's fair to say for everyone uh, on the call, both personally and professionally, it's been two years of unprecedented change and, and, uh, and a sense of uh, chaos perhaps that went along there. Uh, and we've all, I dare say, have a personal and professional story, um, which is very deep and meaningful and, and very, um, very poignant about how we've experienced the last two years in this state of change. But if I think about the first sort of period, and as we started going to lockdown, um, Ericsson Australia took a, a position in March of 2020 to uh, uh, have everyone working from home from the long weekend in March 2020, the 13th of March 2020. Uh, and in fact, have been working in a working from home environment right up until March of this year, so almost two years. And I guess in that sort of first period, uh, and I guess part of the sort of cycle of change, obviously it's a whole period of fear, uncertainty, and an impact on productivity and our respective organisations. And what we said as a leadership community is saying, what is the most important thing that our people are saying that they want to hear? not necessarily about what the business is, where it's going, but what do they want to hear? And our view was they want to hear the message, how do you help me keep me and my family safe? So in terms of our calling for the leadership and what our response was is how do we primarily answer that question? And so our focus in that first period of time was really to say, how do we ensure that we can continue to work both in our workplaces? And for us, our workplaces means some of us, very few people were in the office, a lot of people remained in our field organisation, working with our operators to keep the mobile networks working and continue to um, you know, maintain and expand that connectivity. Um, but also to ensure that people are able to work safely and well in their home environment, both as our employees as well as with our customer. And so our response around that and how do we sort of practically do that, a lot of focus was saying, how do we enable that to happen? We are very fortunate insofar as we had um, sufficient equipment and infrastructure to help some people set up working from home quite early. Um, we delivered a lot of our existing desk infrastructure, screens and so forth that were left in the office um, unattended and we were able to arrange for those to be delivered to the home environment and that was obviously very helpful for a lot of people. A lot of focus was put on around what we call our wellness campaigns and many of you would have done the same. How do we continue to maintain people both physically and, and, uh, and emotionally uh, being supported during this period of uncertainty and productivity? Double down on EAP, making sure that we're ensuring that we're providing that level of uh, connecti connection and way that people could at least help be self-maintained around their wellness and well-being during that time. Um, I'll just mention the last thing before the last click, and that is about what we call a contract leave campaign. So we actually did an extra piece of work around introducing a, uh, a leave campaign for our contractors, which means that we're able to provide a level of uh, sick pay or uh, pay leave for our contractors to ensure that they were making good decisions about how they were working and ensuring that they were coming into the workplace uh, with the impact of COVID, uh, if it had impacted them or their families. That second phase then in 2021 and, and what happened there, it was really about saying, okay, we've got the basics right now. We've got people safe. People feel a sense of investment into them and their family from a health and safety viewpoint. The most important thing for us in our view was to ensure people remain connected whilst we're still trying to work out how this whole COVID world going to work. And so our investment there and our call for leadership was to make sure that we invest in the capability of our first line managers and leaders, strengthening the trust, intimacy and support between an employee and their immediate manager, 
our view was that no one was listening to the, uh, um, uh, with no disrespect to our executive here in Australia, which I'm part of it, uh, but to our executive at the global organisation or, you know, on the other side of the world. People were primarily saying, how do I remain connected to my immediate team, my tribe, the people that I primarily feel connected to? And that was their immediate team of five or six or seven or ten people. So putting investment in that capability around what we called our um, first line leadership, around coaching in particular, making them aware of what the impacts and the realities of people were feeling and, and experiencing along the way and regarding that investment. Uh, and finally, using uh, what we called our communities, which is our sort of subset of the organisation around our young professionals, um, uh, around our emerging women leadership and, and so forth, which were already existing there, making sure we were using them to create connection and ongoing um, feeling of belonging. The final phase then is we sort of come out of last year and, and for those that um, are based here in Victoria, we, we would know that we were coming out of two years of, of lockdown. In other parts of Australia, they also experienced a, a lockdown uh, throughout 2021, perhaps not quite as long as the people in Victoria, but regardless, uh, all of our people here in Australia and New Zealand were looking for a sense of, well, we're now starting to come out of restrictions in the way that we can work, at least from a government regulatory viewpoint. How do I feel that I can see a way forward? Where do I fit in this organisation, having been disconnected for such a long period of time? And really our call as, as leadership and our, our leadership committee, not just within the executive but within the first lines, is for all of us, all of us to create a very clear and compelling vision of what we want the future of work to be experienced by our workforce. And, and really for that now, it's about um, being putting in this additional investment into training and developing our leaders to take the primary voice in the way we want people to experience work around hybrid working and creating a sort of a, an invigoration of what that looks like um, in, in our community. And I can share a little bit more a little bit about that. But that was sort of a snapshot, I guess, sort of condensed really about what our experience is. What does that translate to? And, and I guess one of the things that we would uh, like to, to hold out there, and I guess one of the things that we were probably surprised about, but pleasantly surprised about, is between the period of when COVID sort of started and when we started initiating these changes, we continue to engage and ask our people about where they are at, get feedback about uh, how they're experiencing, and, and we have a, an ongoing engagement survey, as I'm sure all of you do. We run that twice a year. A couple of the key measures there around, you know, do I feel a sense of belonging? Do I feel a sense of connectedness? And do I feel a sense of trust in my manager were the two scores that actually went up um, between pre-COVID, so towards the end of 2019, and when we're right in the thrust of it, uh, and we've been able to maintain that level of um, response from our employees. Of course, as we come into the new year, we have yet to, to run that engagement survey. So not sure where that's going to end, but we felt that this was part of our sort of success along the way. Uh, and also experienced uh, some uh, you know, ongoing support and, and improvement in our financials. In terms of, um, well, I'm able to stop there. Carmel, what, what, do you, what, uh, what would you like me to sort of share more? Yeah, so, um, you know, really great learning so far, Colin, and also great to hear you really bring to life some of those success elements that we talked about. So, you know, creating that vision for the future, you know, world of work post pandemic, but also, you know, the investment in your people. And I know we've, you know, partnered quite closely on that, that future ready talent piece. You know, can you bring that to life um, for us more around, you know, the, the focus on investing in your people as part of this plan? Mm. Well, yeah, um, thanks, Carmel. I mean, I think um, maybe to contextualise our, our, our business a little bit more, which, which might help. I mean, we're an organisation which is, generates value through the sort of competence that we're able to bring to the table for our customers. And, and as a global organisation, the expectation when we work with Telstra or Optus or TPG or MBM as our primary customers is saying um, we want that competence and we want the best competence in the world. Uh, and that, by definition, won't all be physically sitting here in Australia. Around about 60% of what we do towards our customer, uh, both towards our internal processes and also towards the sort of value add part of our top line, comes from people who will never set foot in Australia. So 60 to 70% of what we deliver towards the value add customers and our internal is done by an organisation and an ecosystem of capability that sits outside a country. 
Um, in fact, that's been a way that we've been working for many, many years pre-COVID. Now, what, why is that relevant? And it's relevant because when we start thinking about what generates value for our customers is three parts we're working on. How do we continue to maintain our sort of technology leadership is our sort of strategic priority number one. So we are, we believe the, the primary um, drivers of 5G technology across the world. Across the, world. the second th th thrust is around how do we continue to generate value and a great customer experience for our own customers. And the third pillar of that is about how do we continue to maintain uh, and be able to attract and deliver our customers high, the highest competence and highest critical human capital that we can bring to the table. So this third pillar is what we've called future ready talent. And the future ready talent is where we position human capital in the organization and saying, this is equal to the ability of our, our, our us to generate value for 5G leadership and to create a great customer experience for us. So investment to attract, uh, uh, attract, retain, and to motivate that capability is absolutely critical for us, as it is for many organizations. We then drill it down to, well, how do we, how does that manifest in our human capital? So we say there's two questions we want to ask. How do we want our people, uh, what do we want our people to experience when they're working with Ericsson? And, and how do we as a leadership community want to lead and how do we, our people want to be led? So when we think about our people experience, there's two parts of our investment. What do we need to do to attract and continue to develop and have at our forefront strongest possible capability we can towards our customer, which means we have an ongoing investment in our learning development and we also make sure that we ongoing attracting that capability outside the organisation to bring them in. The second piece is then about how do we create a compelling EVP? You know, it's the utopia, isn't it, of human capital? How do you create an argumentation that both attracts and retains the organisation? And when we think about this, this is not just about our immediate workforce, but our contractors and our partners who form part of that competence um, ecosystem that we bring to the, the table. When it comes to, and, I'll, and if I had more time, I'd be able to explain a bit more about what we met about that, but we were going to focus about leadership, which is where Carmel's took this conversation today. And there's two parts of that. And the two focus areas is how do we um, ensure that we have an inclusive culture? and that we create an environment where we can absolutely make sure people bring their best to the workplace, that they feel that they are not only safe, but they can make sure that they're encouraged to bring the absolute best to their, their work and to the environment that they are they're working in, and in an environment which is both contemporary and flexible the way that we engage those people. I'll just take a drink of water. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, Colin. Can I ask you another question while you're doing that? Sure. Um, so th thanks for bringing that to life. You know, as we do, you know, think about the future and, and, and as you plan next steps, whether it's future of work, whether it's, you know, a hybrid working environment, you know, wh what is Ericsson's plan around that? Mm. Um, well, I, I would say that we've been working on a little bit around this uh, right at the beginning. So I remember doing our first workshop about this sort of what's called post-COVID working, maybe the best way to describe it, um, in around about April or May of 2020. At that stage, I think we're all thinking, oh, you know, COVID should be, it's obviously a bit tough at the moment, but a few months maybe we'll, we'll have it sort of resolved and we'll be ready to, to come back. But maybe we're not quite going to come back the way that we were. Here we are two years down the track, and I guess we're only starting to um, you know, ex experience some level of recovery and, and, and being able to recover back to, to something like a, a so-called normalised workforce, whatever that means. Um, so it's a plan that's been sort of evolved over the last little while, but what we've said is that when it comes to the future work, there's three, the, the most starting point about what we want to do is start off with a, a vision about how we want people to do experience work. And the starting point, and this is sort of super important because we want to sort of start with a place that says, well, how do I create an environment where people can deliver their best from wherever they are uh, to be fully connected and to deliver great things together? So this sense of connectivity, being collaborative and feeling a sense of being belonging is a sort of forefront about how we then do something about that. And that's really created sort of a North Star, if we like, to sort of say, okay, this is, this is where we want to be able to respond to that. And we responded to that in sort of three parts. One is around what we've called flexible working. Oh, I should actually help with the acronyms here. 
Um, MOI stands for Market Area Oceania, Southeast Asia and India. So Ericsson is constructed according to five geog global geographies. Our area is sort of Southeast Asia, Oceania and, 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 uh, and India. Uh, so that's what MOI stands for. So what's flexible working in our market area look like? And we said, well, there's some stuff that we need to do around there. Part is around policy, parts around sort of governance and around sort of tools, the things that we're very familiar with, you know, sort of enablers around the workplace. And then we need to get that pretty right. Although we don't have to get that perfectly right, but obviously we need to continue to, to be able to evolve that. The second piece is really about around how do we create a sustainable working environment? Um, this is why we talked about the second uh, threat, thread being around wellbeing. And wellbeing is not only saying, how do we create a physical and safe environment where people can, can come back into the physical workplace, but also regardless of where that work has been done, whether it's remote in the location in the city, for example, of employment, or that work has been done out of a shared service centre in India or on the west coast of the US or on uh, in, in Europe and our, our comrades in, in Europe, um, it's saying how do we create an environment where people continue to feel a sense of inclusivity and that they are working in collaboration to get a great outcome for the customer, which, by the way, is, as I said at the earlier beginning, we've been working that way for about 10 years. So it's really sort of more of the same and recognising, you know, even if people are based here in Melbourne um, and they're not working in the office today in Melbourne, they're just as effective working in um in, uh, in uh, Glen Iris, a suburb of Melbourne, as it would be if they're working in the office here or in India or on the other side of the world. So creating sustainable work practices in a way that's inclusive is super important. And the third thread of that is around, and this is, you know, we know this as human capital um, experts, everyone around the table understands this. The most impactful and most effective way that has to happen is making sure that we're investing in our leaders. And so we've taken an absolute focus in the last 18 months to invest in our leaders, both in the coaching I mentioned last year, but now doing an extra additional set of programs about helping leaders understand how to create sustainable work practices and in the way that they behave, both in the physical world and in the virtual world to create the sense of inclusion um, and, and, and well-being um, that is so essential for our way of working. I love this framework. Colin, and I think it's so great that, you know, as an organisation, you've taken the time to strategize around this and, and to set these priority areas because we, we have experienced lots of organisations who, you know, probably do have, um, you know, a, a lack of sense of clarity at lower levels within the organisation, but attending to take this kind of, you know, everything's fine um, type approach and we can continue as normal. So this is fantastic. Um, you know, what I'd be curious to learn more about is in practical terms, you know, how does this come to life for your leaders and your employees and, you know, whether there's been any learnings that you can share in, um, in what, what you have implemented so far? Yeah, I'm happy to, to do that. And again, I just want to go back to another comment I made about um, what I'll share with you. Um, I, I think what we'll try to do, this sort of model that we're talking about today, I think is really uh, quite applicable to many different industries and different scales. So regardless of an organisation like ours, you know, global organisation, uh, or even bigger organisations, or perhaps an organisation that's only you know, 30 or 40 people, I think the principles remain the same. You know, how are you going to set up your work in a way that allows flexibility, enables you as a business to be able to access competence and capability um, either by your immediate workforce or even with your partners? A sort of flavour flavor number, flavor number one. Flavour number two is around how do you create sustainable ways of working with your, with your, uh, with your workforce? Um, and, and thirdly, about how is you're going to enable your leaders and your managers um, regardless of your size, to be able to manage that whole sort of framework. So um, in terms of, uh, and this one is a little bit busy, so bear with me, everyone. I've, I've deliberately led some, left some words on here, a lot of words, to hopefully be able to sort of flesh out what I'm going to explain to you. So, so bear with me around that. Uh, I mentioned before about, um, you know, Ericsson had a long history about working with this sort of sense of collaboration through and with different teams right across the globe. Um, and, and this is a really important sort of premise for us because 
this is really important for us to be able to work this way so that we can create value that is top line and bottom line value to our customers. So that's the sort of starting point. How do we make sure that we can engage that capability from regardless of where it's located across the world to be part of the, the ecosystem that generates value towards our customers? Um, and and prior, even prior to COVID, as I mentioned, we'd had sort of 60 or 70% of what we've done was through talent that was not co-located in this country or perhaps will never have direct face-to-face -face contact with our customers. And again, that's important. We think about our businesses, even if we've got a business of 30 people, not all the competence that you need as a business of 30 people will be within your business. You'll pick a partner, a service partner, you know, contract certain pieces of work out. Working in a sort of virtual and virtual environment is super important about generating value for your customer. So how, uh, what have we done specifically around that? Beginning of um, last year, uh, about this time last year, our global organisation made a statement about the fact that we envisaged that we would never want to work the same way ever again. Uh, and that even whenever COVID got to a point of being managed, which hopefully we're at, um, that we foreshadowed that um, people will want to experience and we will want our people to experience a different way of working. What's really important um, in this blue bubble is that the accountability of that comes from managers and their immediate teams. We are a big organisation. It's pretty easy for us to come up with a global directive or even a local directive saying, they'll shut, you know, work this way. You'll work five days in the office or three days in the office or only on Mondays or never on Tuesdays. Um, that absolutely uh, disenfranchises both the employees and the managers. And by working this way, we believe it gives accountability of managers and their teams to work out how and where work needs to be done which by definition will take into account the personal preferences and the role that those individuals will do. So it sort of takes away from the sort of industrialised, one-size-fits-all approach, but absolutely places the accountability of how to work within the team and with the line manager. The second piece is um, it actually doesn't mean that we're going to close down the office. In fact, we actually think um, collaborative spaces, whether they're in our own office or with the customer, are super important to bring a sense of culture and belonging and a sense of collaboration, which I've just made a note here, I can't really spoke about before. Collaboration is important. It's important for very purposeful work. So if you're doing the creative work, you're doing the negotiation work, you're creating um, a new project with your customer, there is no doubt that being able to do that from time to time in a face-to-face -face environment is super important. You and I did that the other day when we caught up for a cup of coffee for the first time in three years. Uh, it, it's important to build relationship and there's a space for that to be done in, in offices. And in the third area, and it goes back to our sort of final uh, point about leadership, is about uh, recognising that we have to continue to equip our line managers to do the first two things really well. It's pointless saying, manager, you have accountability to work out how you're going to work. And by the way, do it in a sustainable fashion that brings people together and inclusive without the capability uh, um, and, and support to be able to do that. So recognising that, um, uh, building into our culture, building into our training, building into our selection process about people that are put into leadership roles uh, with that sort of mindset of flexibility is, is super important, uh, as well as empowering them to be able to make those decisions. Great, thank you, Colin. Just a you know a, qu a question that I'll throw to you on the on the leadership um, aspect, and then we can we can see what questions are coming through um, from our attendees today. Uh, you know, you've talked about you know the fact that you are investing in your leaders and helping to shift their mindset about you know the new way of leading and to develop their capability. Um, have there been any learnings across the way or, you know, any, um, you know, key opportunities that you've come across or, or results that you're already seeing? Um, yeah, I think that the, uh, the learning, which is sort of the obvious at one level, is that <laughs> even leaders don't have one size fit all. <laughs> I think uh, it, it is a reality of our, our, uh, our role as leaders and our leaders in the human capital space is, is that we're still dealing with the human condition and even, 
when we think about how we want to enable our leaders to be able to, to run this race and to be able to equip their, themselves and their organisation, um, they are still uh, different people on the scale of leadership capability and their own sort of uh, journey to be able to, um, you know, evolve and, and, and change their way of thinking. Um, you know, we uh, have here in Australia uh, our leadership community, and we call it a community um, which means more than just line managers. So our line managers are part of our leadership community, but it's also people that are in senior individual contributor roles that have uh, responsibilities of influence. And we have 150 people in that organisation uh, managing an organisation of 1,200 people. Um, and they are, um, uh, guess what, 150 people are all the same when it comes to that, to that level of uh, embracing the future. Uh, I think... A lot of it has to do with being able to recognise uh, and embrace where your own biases are and where your own acceptance of this change is uh, and to recognise that the areas and the way that we would want to work individually um, may or may not be suitable for the way of going for the future. And if we recognise that and we've got an openness to, to evolve to something different, then we can change along the way. Um, we've, we've had... Um, uh, a number of conversations where people have said, look, I understand all this and I understand this at sort of a very academic level, but smart engineers in our organisation, they get that. They get all the pictures, they get all the numbers and all the things that you sort of shared earlier, which we have shared with some of them. Uh, uh, but there's a piece that goes on up here and there's a piece that goes on up here. And, and there's still a part of them that says, I understand that, but in order to be able to be effective in my way of leading, I really need to have that sort of physicality around. I need to be able to take the conversations face to face. I need to have them outside the door here uh, and be able to engage with them. And that, uh, you know, that's not always going to be possible. Uh, and it's not always the most effective way of leading. Um, the other thing that I would also say to this audience and, and the program I just described before with the, um, the flexible working wellbeing and future ready leadership, we are running across the, the market area. I mentioned before our market area covers uh, everywhere as far west as India, as far north as Vietnam, as far south as Hobart, <laughs> and as far east as Auckland, uh, and everywhere in that sort of geography and, and recognising that we're working very different cultures um, and also different sort of regulatory environments as well. Not all those countries have started to return to the office at the same time. The COVID conditions in many parts of Southeast Asia and India are still being challenging. Um, even more so than here in Australia, and, and they are at different points along the, along the journey. And I think there is a, a long way for us to, to go to till we come to a you know, point of normalisation. Great. Okay, so we've got some great questions pouring in. Um, so I'll read out one of the first, um, which is, Colin, whether you can tell us a bit more about the leadership development interventions um, that have been rolled out. Yeah, um, thank you. That's um, a very good question. So there are a couple of pieces around that. I mean, part of it is around, um, and I don't like using the word softer skills, but you all know what I mean when we talk about softer skills, but it's about how do you equip the manager with the ability to work with the human condition? So understanding, building intimacy and trust with the individual people um, before we start talking about how they're going to do the work and what work they're going to do. So it's about really about how they're going to, to engage. So a lot of work around sort of, um, first of all, creating psychological safety, um, you know, really understanding uh, what's happening uh, around uh, the challenges around mental mental health um, around, and around psychological um, stress that's been in place for all of us in the last couple of years. Um, doing a little bit of work around recognising what's happening at sort of more broader sort of social um, levels. For example, we're just starting to explore some conversations about substance abuse around, around uh, domestic abuse um, all those sort of um, things that we've heard that have been sitting in the background and, and you know, presenting themselves in, in the last little while, um, starting to create some awareness around what that looks like, um, around um, unconscious bias, and we all know what we mean about that, but even more so about why that's important about, well, if you're going to create a hybrid environment where sometimes you see your people outside the door and sometimes they'll always be on Teams or on Zoom, um, and making sure that we're creating bias in the way that we want to lead towards that, all those type of things. That's sort of um, sort of the one bundle. The second bundle that we're looking at is about some very practical stuff. We've started uh, a framework about how to help managers work out for specific roles 
is the nature of their role uh, lend itself easily to working mostly remotely, mostly collaboratively, or somewhere that's zipped in between. And like many organisations, I dare say most of the people here, we have large proportions of organisation have said, uh, either formally through a survey or, or you know, anecdotally, that they really want to embrace a hybrid way of working. And, and, and it's the same with us. So we have 85% of our people that consistently said that for the last two years, uh, that that's the way I want to work. But for the manager, how do I take that on board? How do I come to a way of being able to say, this role works really well in a very, um, it can work very well fully remotely. Uh, this role works very well and needs to work in a very highly collaborative space, which means that they need a lot of face time. All these roles can work in a hybrid manner. So we've got a framework that sits around that. And, and, and broadly, maybe I'll share just briefly about what those dimensions are. Uh, the dimensions are, we say, is the role highly internally focused or highly towards the customer? So if the role is very customer centric, for example, a sales role, a business development role, um, a solution development role, that role is more likely than not going to need much more face-to-face -face time than a role that's very internally focused. So if a role is, for example, the other extreme might be a payroll function or a very strong administrative function. Um, it might be in the legal space. It might be um, uh, something in a sort of support area, which doesn't generate top line for us. Uh, then maybe that role by definition is much more internally focused and lends itself more to remote working than, for example, the sales role. Um, that's one dimension. The other dimension is to what extent does that person need to have collaboration? And, you know, if we're frank with ourselves, all of us need some level of people connection from time to time. It just comes down to for what purpose. So many of those roles, we require a lot of collaboration around design, around coming up with solutions together, um, being able to negotiate contracts and so forth. That's a highly collaborative role. Again, creating sort of uh, an environment where most of those, those roles will need more time together. And so that sort of framework uh, helps our managers say, let's say I've got a team of 10 people. Not all 10 people are going to work the same way. Oh, this person would like to work four days a week because, you know, they've got um, uh, yeah, requirements for, for supporting their childcare requirements or maybe they're sharing their parenting requirements with their, their partner. Um, to be frank with all of you, I'm now a grandfather for the first time uh, and, uh, and we have our daughter and our granddaughter living with us at home as a result of COVID um, separation uh, and uh, our two-year-old and, and I'm responsible now uh, for the first time in my life uh, actually uh, looking after our two-year-old daughter on the first day at home. So, you know, that's an exa you know, example around that. You know, maybe some would say I should have done that my, my children. Um, uh, but what I'm saying there is recognising that the nature of our roles needs to be sort of bespoke enough and, and customised enough and managers to be able to do this mm -hmm. and have the skills to be able to do it. Long, long answer. <laughs> no, very insightful one. And um, if I could add to that, I think, you know, we've partnered with you on on in various components of that, you know, future ready leadership and, and co-designing learning experiences. And something that's really stood out to us is, you know, the openness to learning and that continuous learning mindset, but also the, the safe environment that's created where, you know, one of the exercises that you've mentioned around leaders having to select what that could look like and different ways of working, how you know, the aha moment was, wow, this actually isn't as easy as it looks and we are going to need to have to try, you know, new ways of thinking and, and put some thought and effort into this. Um, so, yeah, it was, it was great to see that, that aha moment for your leaders. Um, but we've got lots more questions coming in. Um, so um, another question is, Colin, can you give us a couple of examples of sustainable work practices? Uh, sustainable work practices. Um, uh, <laughs> you know, I, I'm going to be very transparent around that. I don't know if I can give you uh, some examples around that, other than to say that we are uh, ensuring that, well, maybe I can offer this. One of the things that we do do, um, and I mentioned before, we work in a very sort of global um, manner, a lot of our collaboration works with teams uh, in different time zones. Uh, so as an example, so as my own personal experience is my, I have two bosses 
Uh, I have a client relationship, so I support the CEO of Ericsson Australia um, in my geography, but my functional boss, my head of HR, is based in India. Uh, my peers in the HR community are mainly based in India or in Southeast Asia. Um, we have set a practice that we will not have any uh, online meetings, in fact, we don't have any meetings at all, uh, that are within that community uh, on a Friday, which means that um, even though we have a time zone difference of five and a half hours now between ourselves and India, uh, it means that we, uh, I can feel confident <laughs> that, um, uh, that we are not likely to have a meeting that might be run at three o'clock in the afternoon in, in Delhi time, uh, which would be eight, eight o'clock, eight thirty my time on a Friday night. So, um, but even that means we never, not we never do that because sometimes we do that early in the week. But there is a discipline that goes around that, and at least a recognition and a a um, a, a way of working, uh, which we really hold each other account around about recognizing, respecting the different time zones that we work in. Um, so that would be one. Um, and the other thing I was going to mention about is um, about the. The campaigns we ran last year and the year before, um, we did a lot of the stuff that many of you would have done around, um, you know, things around yoga programs and health and nutrition um, and so forth around that. That was all, you know, sort of helpful and important. One of the things that we also try to do um, this year is try to translate that in just, just about doing sort of programs around health and well-being, but simply just having fun and being able to learn together. Um, we did a campaign late last year where we had um, online events while we we're still in lockdown. Um, but we had, for example, come in, someone come in and do an hour to talk about a book review. Um, in fact, we interviewed Peter Fitzpatrick around, around that book review that they uh, had done. Um, we did a, a, um, a little online um, event with Costantino the Magician, which we did for both employees and, and, uh, and their families on a, a Friday afternoon um, after school hours for people just to come on, to just have a bit of fun together uh, and, and hopefully feel a sense of connection and sort of you know, well-being that comes from that. Um, we're now looking as we move into the hybrid world, a combination of um, sort of uh, hybrid events uh, that are done both uh, online as well as in the offices as we start to return. Great. And I won't mention the... Um the music band activity and, and your 3G band, Colin. Uh, well, you know, we wanted people to stay on this call. I mean, a, a threat <laughs> to uh, Laura and Carmel is that one of the things that uh, I, and this is just giving me a bit of a platform now, thank you, is we, we've, uh, we, have a, we have a band inside the Ericsson Band of which uh, uh, I am the token uh, old person apparently in the band because it's all made up of 20-something roles. Uh, and uh, we, started, we started that actually just before COVID and we've done a couple of events um, before COVID. But one of the things that we did do during uh, lockdown was to uh, actually record some music sort of remotely and then it got put together in some video clips. So, uh, you yeah, know, maybe as a later session, Carmel, uh, you know, if it's a part two, maybe I'll get to show the video of our, our, our band doing its thing. <laughs> <laughs> we can organise that, Colin. Okay, we have lots of questions coming through. We have um, time for one or two more. The next one is around what has been the experience regarding the office occupancy trends? So with the ability to choose, are employees and managers embracing the positives you mentioned about connecting in person or still predominantly working virtually? Yep, no, that's fine. Um, so we sort of had a... Uh, I sort of mentioned before about the different countries coming back uh, as in conditions improve in a sort of COVID safe environment. There was a <coughs> level of corporate governance which went around that, which means we had to get approval from our uh, region um, uh, leadership team about we are now ready to be able to come back to, for example, 25% occupancy or 30% occupancy or 50% occupancy as the regulations change in Australia. So we've only actually got to the point of you know, um, full unregulated, deregulated environment uh, in the last couple of months since the beginning of April, um, where it's sort of you know, free for anyone to come in the office uh, according to local conditions. Uh, the question is, how many have come back? We have uh, 600 people normally based uh, in our office here in, in Melbourne and around about 300 based in our office in Sydney. And um, what I can say to you is on a peak load in the last couple of weeks, 
that we've had about 100 out of 600 people come back to the office. So, um, you know, the maths there is you know, sort of sub 20%. Um, we've had about the same come back to our office in North Rye. Now, uh, to contextualise that, we gave our sort of uh, instructions and our sort of release to our managers to start experimenting and return to the office only at the beginning of April. So we're now into sort of, what is that, sort of week five or week six. So we're seeing around about 20% to let's say 20% um, come back to the office under those arrangements since the since the beginning of April. Um, you know, I, I think we are not alone with many organisations seeing something similar to that. What we have envisaged is that in the longer term, people will broadly speak work broadly speaking for most roles on average be working 50-50 between um, the home environment and the office environment. That is, as I said before, by no means a, a directive or a mandate or anything other than just our best guess. But what's what we're expecting in the long term? Great. Okay, so time for one more question. And by the way, Colin, there's lots of comments here around how insightful your presentation was. No um, so final question, how did you coach your leaders who did resist the new ways of working, in particular flexible work and hybrid? Yeah, it's interesting, as and, and and I think it only comes by um, by example and almost by peer pressure at one level, um, which is not to say that you should do this, but we're very much an organisation that leads by example. We are by our very nature of our culture, uh, we're not a we're sort of conflict adverse. I would say is the best way to describe it. We like people to um, get to their own place of learning and understanding by experience rather than by directive. Um, it, it is absolutely true that a number of people still remain um, a, a little bit resistant, but they are reducing as time goes by. And it's really saying, finding those people that can be um, are prepared to experiment, they're prepared to describe and showcase what has worked for them and things that don't, don't work for them um, and be able to put them up as, a, as examples so that other people can follow that example. What I can say, it is a slow burn. Um, and, you know, I think we have to all recognise that if we had this conversation in six months' time, you know, we might have got a little bit further down the track, but I don't think we're going to have it all solved in six months' time. We don't think we have it solved necessarily in 12 months' time. But what is absolutely important for all of us as leaders in the human capital industry and in the human capital profession uh, is that we continue to push the organisation, continue to recognise the way that people want to work to create a compelling working experience for all of us uh, and the, for the organisations that we lead and ensure that we create an environment where we can attract and retain the capability that we need, you know, extended workforce to be successful in our own businesses. Great. Thank you so much, Colin, for your time today. It's been so insightful hearing you talk about the journey and from what I can see from all the comments, um, all of our attendees agree and have, have gotten a lot out of today's session. Um, you know, key takeaways for, for me have been, you know, the fact that you have flexed and adapted depending on the stage that your organisation and your people were at, but also using data to, um, you know, gain insight into how your people were feeling and, and what they needed and creating that compelling vision for the future, but also investing in the capability of your people so that they can, um, you know, take their teams on this journey. Um, but also learn, you know, learn as you go. So um, thank you again. And um, I see you're in the office today, so I can let you get back to some innovation and, and collaboration you now. <laughs> very good. Thanks. For, I wish everyone all the very best. By all means, if you wish to carry on uh, the conversation a bit further, please reach out LinkedIn with a, with a message. Uh, and uh, I'm very happy to take a conversation with you or your team or your organisation anytime if I can be supportive to you. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Colin. And thanks to our network for attending today. Have a great day.